today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you. And thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. So nice to be with you here in studio. We are coming to you live. It's been a few weeks, uh, but we are glad to be uh, back in the saddle, uh, coming to you live right now. And we've got a very special episode for you today. This is episode 101. And so we are very excited to be heading into the next century Uh, of episodes. If you haven't had the chance yet, I really want to encourage you to go back and listen to our past few episodes. We've had on some wonderful guests. A few weeks back, we had Dan Wallace, and we were talking about that famous Mark Fragment. Some might think now it's infamous. Uh, That Mark Fragment, a second century, possibly early third century Mark Fragment, the arguably the earliest fragment of Mark that we now have. Very exciting stuff uh, to uh, learn about. And a couple weeks ago, we interviewed uh, Abdu Murray from RZIM on his book, Saving Truth, which dealt more about cultural issues. And then last week, boy, last week, what an episode we had for our 100th episode, N.T. Wright. Uh, What a blessing that was uh, to be talking with him. And uh, I I hope that you enjoyed the episode. We talked about a host of different topics. And uh, I would love to get your thoughts, your feedback on that show. Um, And also, um, since... I'm always forgetting to do this. I want to remind you, if you've been a long-time listener of the program, please take a moment and write a nice review for us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Uh, We would love for people to come across our program and then to get what other listeners already have found and discovered about the program. Uh, So on today's program, uh, we are uh, joined by uh, Craig Keener a famous New Testament scholar, and he's a very humble man as well, so he, he might not admit it as much. Uh, there, there's Craig on the screen. Craig, thanks so much for joining us on the program today. Great to be with you. Um, all right, so for those that don't know you, you are the F.M. and Ada Thompson Professor of Biblical Studies. Uh, before um, coming to Asbury Theological Seminary, where you're at now, you were over at the seminary at uh, Eastern University, if I remember correctly. <laughs> And uh, you have just a, um, a massive corpus of writings uh, to your name. And uh, 22 books, I believe. Uh, I'm sure you've been an editor to numerous volumes. You've got these commentaries. These commentaries are so thick um, that it would take... I mean, you've written more than like the words in the Bible, I'm sure. <laughs> the words in the Bible obviously take priority. Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> but your thoughts have uh, been uh, very helpful to uh, those that have been trying to understand what the Bible is in fact saying. And uh, so, when I contacted you to see if you wanted to come on the program, we were talking about topics, and uh, if I'm remembering correctly, one of the things you wanted to do was to um, look at uh, ways that people have taken verses out of context. And yes. so, uh, for this This program, uh, while we could talk about so many issues, and towards the end of the program, I do want to get your thoughts on uh, some recent uh, topics of interest to people, undesigned coincidences, and literary devices. We're going to save that for the back end of the program today. Uh, And instead, we're first going to talk about various different verses which have been taken out of context. And uh, so you've listed a few here. I'm going to start off with one, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, okay? And... um, Now, I'm going to mix in these Bible verses here as well with some questions about theory and how we should do interpretation. So, so we'll sure to give it some good meaty stuff. But, but here, I'm going to throw this verse at you and see what you think. Are you ready? Maybe. (laughs) For, uh, for, um, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and to give you hope. Yeah. That verse is about me, right? It's about God's special plan (laughs) for what he's going to do in my life. God is letting Judah know that after the judgment, he still has plans for them. He's going to restore restore them, and he's going to keep them in the meantime. Uh, but, yeah, they're going to be in exile in the meantime. So, so, um, so you're telling me that verse is not about me? Well, I mean, if you want to apply it to yourself, you can extrapolate by thinking 
this shows us the heart of God. God is faithful, and that even if you're under judgment now, or part of a nation that's under corporate judgment, um, you know, if you're part of God's people, God still has a, a plan. That's right. Yeah. So you can learn about God's faithfulness, which does apply to all of us. Mm. So, yeah. So you're saying basically you're breaking the hearts of everyone who takes that verse <laughs> and applies it to themselves. <laughs> well, before you apply it to yourself, figure out what it meant in its original context. Yes. And then you can make the application to yourself appropriately, mm. to yourself and to your context appropriately. Yes, that that then that's a great you know introductory principle. We first have to understand what it meant to those people, um, and then we can learn to apply it and understand what it means for us. Uh, so, otherwise, what you end up doing is just um, whatever you think the verse means, you apply it to yourself, even if that's not what it actually is talking about. Mm. Um, so, I believe all scripture is for all time, but not all scripture is for all circumstances. And we need yeah. to understand the circumstances so we can make sure to apply it analogously. Yeah. Nice. That's good. All right. Let's uh, hammer out a few of the verses you had that you wanted to talk about. And I need to look them up or even find – I've got a Bible on the shelf. I'll probably run over there. John 10.10 10, uh, mm -hmm. was one. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in full uh, or to the full. How, how is this verse often um, interpreted, and why do you think it's taken out of context? Of course, it's often applied to Satan. And if you just hear the verse by itself, well, you know, the, well, the first part of the verse is often applied to Satan, and mm -hmm. it makes sense. But actually, that's not the, the context of it. Jesus has been talking about thieves and robbers since the beginning of the chapter. Um, those who come before him... Uh, those who try to get in some other way are uh, thieves and robbers, th those who, um, and, and so forth. And the, in the broader context, Jesus has just healed a blind man. Uh, some Pharisaic leaders of a synagogue have put him out and said, you don't belong to us, you don't belong to our people. And Jesus is still talking to them at the end of chapter 9, verses 40 and 41, and basically, he goes on to compare them with thieves and robbers mm. who are exploiting his people. And then the blind man is an example of one of his sheep who does heed his voice. Now, in the Old Testament, God's sheep, that was, that was Israel, that was his people. So, Jesus is saying, they may have put you out of the synagogue, but you still belong to my people. And, of course, the chief shepherd in the Old Testament is God himself, and Jesus is, is in that role but Jesus also, in the immediate context, he's talking about uh, thieves and robbers. And then in verse 12, he talks about wolves, you know, the predators who obviously don't have the best interests of the sheep at heart. Mm. Um, those who exploit the sheep, like in Ezekiel 34 and so on. And Jesus lays down his life protecting the sheep, defending the sheep from these uh, oppressors of the sheep, those who exploit them. Mm. Nice. Um, before we continue, we've got a, a viewer here, Jonathan. He, he's already writing very fondly of you. He says, I think Keener should write a specific commentary on the pastorals, that is the pastoral epistles. He says, I would buy it, as would many. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing as fast as I can. I haven't gotten there. <laughs> uh, tell our audience, um, you've written a number of commentaries. What, what have you uh, written on thus far? I started with a commentary on Matthew. When I started, you know, I didn't have a computer. Uh, so this was pre-computer days. I was keeping everything on index cards. I had about, about 100,000 index cards. Which would explain all the filing cabinets behind you. Right. Yeah. No, those aren't the index cards. Those <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I did Matthew first. I did John, filed all the research forward into Acts Four volume Acts commentary. Um, I'd just done a little one on Romans, a little one on 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, a little one on Galatians uh, and Revelation. Um, uh, I have a bigger one with Galatians coming out with Baker Academic. The smaller one that just came out is with Cambridge. Mm. And 
Yeah, I'm, I'm planning to write a bigger one on Romans and then start working my way through Paul, but uh, there's just, I can't write as fast as There's I, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's keep moving along here with the verses uh, you wanted to t- talk about. So, um, there's John uh, 12, 32, and I had a chance to run over to my shelf, get my Bible. Here we are. Um, this is these, these are sample verses, but sample verses, and I'm sure there are there are plenty. And and for those that are watching along, we've already had a couple people ask about some verses. Although I don't know if that means you have to look it up or if you've got the whole Bible memorized. Uh, um, uh, but 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 this one, uh, Jesus says, "If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw everybody to me." And of course, we sing songs about that, mm. but. If you read you read the context, all you have to do is read the next verse. Yeah, John explains this. He said concerning the the manner of death that he was going to die, mm. and so basically, when you when you sing that, you're singing, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" Now you're not really because God knows our hearts what we mean, but you know, if you're a songwriter, look your verses up in context, mm. please. Before you, uh, <laughs> so what you're saying here is, um, and not only is this used in in our songs, but um, some people in theological discussions uh, also cite this verse about um, uh, lifting people up. Um, so what what he's literally saying here is when he is lifted up from the earth, right? Yes. And so it's about his death. It's not about this sort of spiritual lifting. It's not about a supposed rapture or anything like that. <laughs> Th- this is, you know, as John says, he clarifies right here. All you have to do is read the next verse. Jesus yeah. is talking about his death. So. Yeah. Now, now these these examples may be too simplistic. I mean, you you can skip some of the examples that I gave you, but th- this is part of the way I started paying attention to this was well, first when I started reading forty chapters of the Bible a day because I'd been a recent convert from atheism and I didn't know anything about the Bible. So, you know, after doing that for a while, when I hear a verse, I'd start thinking of the context. And, and that helped me when preachers would quote verses out of context. But when I would be dialoguing with Jehovah's Witnesses or somebody, and they would give their verses for why Jesus is not God, you know, and I'd be responding to them based on the context. Uh, after a while, I realized, huh, my church sometimes does this too. And <laughs> to, to be honest and have integrity with how we handle the scriptures is important. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. Going to the first gospel, uh, Matthew three eleven. Tell us what does the verse say, and how do people normally understand it, and how ought we to understand it? Well, I don't know how people normally understand it, but how people often understand it. John the Baptist is speaking of being baptized in the Holy Spirit and in fire. And if you want to know what the fire is, uh, you know, I mean, it symbolizes a lot of different things in Scripture. It can be most often judgment or Jeremiah speaks of fire shut up in his bones or uh, purification or so on. People often apply it to holiness, which is a good thing to be holy. I mean, you know, and again, what I said about John 10, 10, we know the devil is bad. It's not, I'm not arguing against those theological points, but right. the, the use of these verses, Matthew three eleven. if you start back in, in 3, 10, um, well, actually, back in 3-7, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, Luke has the crowds. Matthew zeroes in a particular part of the crowds. And and John calls them uh, offspring of, of vipers, which, you know, it doesn't set the tone as a very positive, <laughs> godly people he's talking to. And then he speaks of every tree that does not bear good fruit, the fruit of repentance in this context, Will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, the fire there we don't normally see as a positive fire. We normally see it as a negative fire. Mm. That's verse 10. In verse 12, the the one who's coming, his winnowing fork is in his hand. Uh, he's going to thoroughly clear out his threshing floor. What they would do with the winnowing fork, they'd throw the, the wheat into the air. The wind would blow out the lighter chaff. Uh, and the heavier wheat would fall back down. So he says that the, he's going to gather the wheat into his barn, but he's going to burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. The chaff was a symbol of judgment even in the Old Testament. It's worthless. doesn't even make good fuel because it burns so quickly. Mm. This is going to burn with unquenchable fire. This is not happy fire. 
this is sad fire, <laughs> uh, angry fire, whatever. And so <clears throat> if, if it's bad fire in verse 10 and bad fire in verse 12, chances are that's what it is in verse 11. He's addressing the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says he's going to baptize you, plural, in the Holy Spirit and in fire. He's speaking of the eschatological coming time when the Messiah comes. Some people are going to get the Holy Spirit, those who repent and bear good fruit and become the wheat. But those who don't repent and who stay the chaff are going to get the fire. Mm. There seem to be so many verses out there where folks have just really... I mean, in, in a sense, they've they've misread uh, what's going on here, but they haven't even just paid attention to even just a few more verses. Uh, sometimes there are debates over, um, you know, what what a broader uh, context might mean, and yeah. in this case, though, there, it could just be just a couple verses, and folks have already kind of skewed away from what's happening. Um, this morning, I was just. Um, looking at uh, the Gospel of John and an issue there um, about, you know, what day exactly did Jesus die? That was something I was studying myself. I, that's, that's a, I know, yeah, you, <laughs> that's a difficult one, I know. Uh, so, but this, I think, leads to a very uh, important point, uh, perhaps for, for today's discussion, too. Where is that boundary between sort of the obvious um, mis- um, misinterpretations, the obvious taking out of context, and the more difficult ones. So for me, uh, I'm not a Calvinist, and so on Romans 9, I, I think I think Calvinists uh, misinterpret Romans 9. I think they've missed the broader picture. They usually don't read the first and the end parts of chapter 9. Um, they don't get the corporate sense going. But I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say in the same sense that I might, you know, poke someone for interpreting Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, you know, the wrong way. So mm-hmm. where is that line between, hey, you know, that's kind of a silly interpretation versus there are more serious interpretations, they're still mistaken. How do you, how does someone go through and understand or, or, or find that scope? That's a that's a good question. I don't think there's a line that can be drawn. And where we do have disagreements in some of those other issues, we really have to be gracious. I mean, we should be gracious even with a, you know, a verse out of its immediate context. But when it comes to issues like, like Romans 9 or um, a, number of, a number of other issues that people debate about, uh, where you can actually marshal texts on both sides and uh, of the state, um, another one is like, you know, People will cite 1 Timothy 2 or um, 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 on one side of the debate. They'll cite Romans 16, 1 through 7, uh, and Philippians 4, you know, and, and it's Judges. It's kind of like my verses versus your verses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and on, those, on those kind of things, we need to be gracious and recognize, okay, there are reasons why people hold this, mm. and we we can we can at least understand where the other person's coming from it's mm. not uh not necessarily even a bad hermeneutic even if it's not a, 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 if an accurate one yeah 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 that's a good point that there there is we could say that there is robust sort of thinking behind it that there are um laid out reasons we could say that they're thoughtful reasons maybe you, some might say they're good reasons but not greater or, or in some cases <laughs> um it d- depends on how you're using that term good but nevertheless that there's some serious thought here that we should consider something um but we might still think nevertheless it's still a uh, um taking a verse or a whole passages out of context missing the big picture uh bible backgrounds really plays an important point uh, in understanding scripture and not misinterpreting it, doesn't it? Oh yeah, it's it's another level of context. I mean, obviously you start with the literary context, um, but when I was reading forty chapters of the Bible a day, eventually I noticed that you know, well, first thing I noticed is all my Bible memory verses. There's not just a bunch of bl- blank space in between. You know, these verses make sense in a broader context, but after a while, I noticed, like Paul says in Romans 1-7, he's writing this to the uh, those who have been set apart for Christ in Rome. And I said, whoa, I'm not taking that part seriously. 
this is actually a letter to God's people in Rome. Therefore, I need to try to do my best to hear this as a letter to the Romans, first of all. Once I started taking that into account, it was like, okay, I need to go back and learn more about the ancient world. I'd already studied some aspects of the ancient world. I hadn't studied the Jewish context enough. Mm. And when I went back and studied it, well, the first book I found, I was very, I was delighted. It answered some of my questions. But then I, I did something terrible. I read a second book and found <laughs> the first book on like 20 or 30 percent. And I was like, and it should have actually contradicted it on more, I know now. But anyway, uh, so I, I <clears throat> called one of my professors and I said, <clears throat> what am I supposed to do? These books, they disagree. He said, well, just keep studying. So eventually I go through the primary sources. I spend 10 years and you know, now it's been like 30 years. And yeah, there's a lot of background that's helpful. There's a proverb that states, um, one man seems right until another comes and examines him. And it seems that you very much experienced uh, <laughs> uh, that, that proverb. Uh, it can be difficult uh, when people present alternative theories and they provide their reasons. And sometimes these debates really have to go all the way back to, say, the assumptions that a person has yes. uh, uh, about, um, say, Bible backgrounds. Uh, or the assumptions about what an author would or wouldn't do. Uh, yes. And and so the debate, and sometimes very sadly, it, it's not where it has to be had, where you're de- you might be, you know, these are my verses and your, versus your verses sort of debate, but really it should be, hey, let's look at these assumptions. You know, was Paul really thinking that idea when he wrote that? And what reasons would we have for thinking that? Uh, so it can be a very deep debate. Uh, but important one if we want to seek out the truth. Yes. All right, let's check out some other verses here. Uh, Psalm 50.10, and you're going to have to help me on this one. And, oh, that's the cattle on a thousand hills? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, sometimes people will, will claim that. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's faith here, but sometimes uh, I have to be careful with my students because some of them are paying their tuition on that verse. But uh, <laughs> saying you know, cattle on a thousand hills belong to God, well, you know, since he has so many extra, he could sell a few and pay my tuition. Uh. Uh, but the, the context of it really is God is saying, Israel, you know, the problem with you is not that you don't offer me enough sacrifices. The problem is you're not keeping my covenant. And look, you know, don't think that I'm dependent on you for your sacrifices. Like, you know, peoples in the ancient Near East often thought their gods were, you know, their right. gods get hungry if you don't sacrifice enough. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's that's not the issue because look, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. If I want one, I just take it. Mm. That's the point. But, but again, I'm not saying God doesn't supply our needs for what He's called us to do. I'm just saying uh, the direct point of that verse is that uh, God isn't dependent on us. Yes, yes. The theological doctrine of divine aseity. Uh Yeah, that's <clears throat> and, and so I'm I'm a aspiring theologian and there's a fine dance sometimes between theology and biblical interpretation and sometimes the uh, biblical scholars sometimes don't, they don't get along with the theologians and uh, <laughs> but I am I'm one that certainly appreciates the work of, of biblical scholarship and and try to really understand the text and from there let's get our theology uh, so I think that's really important. We've got Peter here watching online. He says, uh, this is beautiful. I always like to know the background of what the original readers are hearing. This was fascinatingly true going through the seven churches of Asia in Revelation. Uh, definitely Bible backgrounds important. Uh, w- perhaps the most f- uh, famous passage of all uh, to those uh, from those letters would be when... Um, Jesus says that he'd uh, rather um, you be hot or cold or else he'll, he'll vomit you out. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and so Bible backgrounds, tell us, Craig, why, why are Bible backgrounds important to that specific passage? Well, because sometimes we think that Jesus is saying, I want you to be hot, fired up for me, or, or just be cold, just be spiritually dead. Uh, just don't be in between. And that's how they take lukewarm. Yeah. But actually... Uh, well, there's some background that has to do with Laodicea specifically, but then, you know, most important here is just the general background that people drank 
and used both hot water and cold water, but water that's just warm. Uh, I, I was actually in Greece a couple weeks ago, and there was hiking up a... a no big deal. <laughs> well, a mountain to, uh, to Delphi, and, uh, and uh, the water that I was carrying with me, I was so thirsty, in my, in my water bottle was warm. And I understood this verse much better based on my experience of... Yes. It was so gross, but I was very thirsty, so I drank it anyway. Um, but, yeah, lukewarm water is just unpleasant. And mm. so the point is not he wants you to be fired up for Jesus or spiritually dead. The point is that he wants you to be... Useful. ...to him, useful to him, not disgusting to him. Yeah. Uh, and in the context of Laodicea, you know, the church in Laodicea had very much absorbed the values of its culture. It was a prosperous banking community. They had their own textile industry there with black wool. Um, they had, um, well, they, they had pretty much going for them except their water supply. They, they had to pipe in their water from far away. Uh, their water supply was very vulnerable. The stone barrel pipes above ground, any besieger could break the, break the pipes and that'd be the end of their water supply. Um, and the water... Uh, you can look at the at the waterfall right across from Laodicea, the um, the, the calcium deposits, the lime deposits. Mm. Not lime, since if you put lemon or lime in your drink, but <laughs> gross stuff. Um, so, the one thing that Laodicea complained about, and we know this from the from the geographer Strabo, uh, the geographer Strabo writes that. Uh, well, the only thing nice he could say about Laodicea's water supply was that the water in Herapolis was even worse. So, in other words... You, the, the, what, the, what you're saying is when people drank the water that was piped in, it tasted it was, nasty. It was nasty. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so, Jesus is saying, you know, okay, you think you're prosperous, you think you've got all this going for you, but actually, you're like that water you're always complaining about. You make me sick. Mm. But then he says, whom I love, I, I discipline. So be zealous, therefore, and repent. Yeah, wow. And it's just, what a different interpretation that is when you understand Bible backgrounds uh, versus, say, what many youth pastors <laughs> take and teach their students. Um, it's almost as if a lot of these ideas, they, they don't even begin in the pulpit. They begin in the student youth center. <laughs> uh, and some people, they just remember those things that their youth pastor taught them. Um, so I, mean, I, I mean, do want to be fired up for Jesus, but that's not what that verse is saying. You've got, Jesus has all these verses about forsake all and follow me. Those are pretty explicit. Mm, mm, yeah. All right. Um, let's turn to Psalm 118.24. And let me read it here. I've got to find it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes. Now, now go back. What's so to, wrong about that verse? <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with the verse. Of course. There's nothing wrong with saying the verse, but it helps to know what the verse is about. If you go back two verses, start with verse 22 and read forward. Okay, here I go. <clears throat> the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So, it's not talking about every day, although we can celebrate it every day, but... It's talking but it's about talking, a momentous occasion. Yes, a particular momentous occasion. And, of course, we know that, uh, you know, however you connect the psalm to Jesus, we know that at least one fulfillment, an ultimate fulfillment of that, is when Jesus is exalted uh, after he's been rejected. And so, yeah, we can celebrate that all the time. But it's not just randomly like this is the day the Lord has made today. And so, yeah. you know, if you want to have a verse about uh, let's rejoice today, try Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always or something. Right, right. So it's not necessarily that the idea or the principle is not found in Scripture. Say, if God has a plan for your life, you know, a, a plan that that is to say he's he's laid out the ways he wants you to live. And that's, you know, a plan. Uh, or that here, as you, in this example, you've said, it's not that we shouldn't always rejoice. I mean, we should, but just that this specific verse wouldn't lend toward that conclusion, that this verse yeah. has a context, it has a scope 
uh, upon which it, it applies. And so for this verse, we should use it for those momentous occasions uh, in, in our, our, our culture, our history, perhaps, maybe even our own lives. But to use it every day would be not quite what the author was thinking. Is that right? I, you know, you've got, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, I think he has like maybe a more momentous, but in any case, um, it's like Matthew 25, whatever you've done to the least of these, my, my brothers and sisters, you've done to me. Mm. Uh, and I don't think in the larger context of Matthew, that's talking about just caring for the poor and so on and that the Lord will reward you. But it is a biblical principle because Proverbs says, whoever gives to the poor lends to the Lord, the Lord will repay them. So, but in Matthew 25, I mean, you, you look through the rest of Matthew, you take Matthew in its context. Th this is what the original hearers of Matthew, the original audience of Matthew would have had in mind when they, when they heard uh, this passage read, because they didn't hear it read just as a, as a verse or as a paragraph. They'd hear the whole gospel of Matthew being read through. So, who are Jesus' brothers and sisters elsewhere in the Gospel of Matthew? Well, you think uh, the end of Matthew 12, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. You think of Matthew 23, you know, you have you have one rabbi, uh, one teacher, uh, one father, and you're all brothers and sisters. Or, or Matthew 28, where he says to the women of the tomb, <clears throat> go tell my brothers. So, <clears throat> um, and then, and then um, you know, uh, Matthew 10, when he sends his disciples out, he says, depend on local hospitality. And, you know, if they give you just a cup of cold water in my name, uh, however they receive you, they receive me. Mm. And so Matthew 25, in the larger context of Matthew, is talking about the agents of the kingdom, the messengers of the kingdom, and nations will be judged based on how they responded to the good news. And he just said in the chapter before, 2414, that... The good news of the kingdom must be preached among all the nations before the end will come. Mm. Anyway, I'm talking too much, but oh, quite all right. No, it, it gives us an insight into also. I would say your writing style. There's there's just so much to be said and noted uh, and carefully observed um, that it, it, these factors are so important to understanding the text in an important way. Um, all right, we've got to take a short break here. Um, but when we come back, I want to ask you some questions about um, the prosperity gospel, uh, which is um, very popular here in the United States. It's huge over in Africa. Um, and uh, also then, towards the end of the program, I've got just a couple questions about uh, um, undesigned coincidences and literary devices as part of some recent <laughs> theological uh, and biblical discussions uh, on that and with some of your uh, folks that you're associated with as well. So, all right, so stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Have you heard of the Google Ad Grant for nonprofits? 501c3 nonprofit organizations can receive $10,000 per month in online advertising credit from Google, empowering you to share your message with the world. At Defenders Media, we partnered with Nonprofit Megaphone, an agency focused solely on Google grant acquisition and management. They got us approved for the grant and now manage ad campaigns, bringing hundreds of new people to our websites each month. If you are eligible, Nonprofit Megaphone will acquire and manage the grant for you for a month for free to see if they can help you too. Visit nonprofitmegaphone.com to learn more. All right, thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. Uh, today, we are talking about verses out of context. 
And uh, our guest is uh, Dr. Craig Keener. Uh, but before we uh, get back into that, um, uh, the, the main portion of today's program, I want to take an opportunity to share with you about the work of Apologetics 315. Apologetics 315 is this wonderful uh, resource website providing daily apologetics resources, including uh, audio, debates, podcasts, book reviews, and more. And so if you haven't had the opportunity to check out that website, apologetics315.com, I want to encourage you uh, to do so. And uh, you can check here, we've got our weekly bonus links that went up uh, yesterday, uh, all sorts of different links to videos and audio files, uh, some articles and talks. Uh, that really, I think, can be edifying to your faith. You can learn more about what it is that you believe. So let me just give you one ex one fine example here. Uh, so we've got a video here of uh, uh, Peter Lighthart of the uh, Theopolis Institute, and he ha we've got this video here that we've linked to, which explains the synoptic problem. You might be wondering, well, what's the synoptic problem? Well, this issue pertains to the ordering of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and who wrote which one, and where were, where did the content come from, and those sorts of questions. So if you uh, have a chance to go and check out that 15-minute video, go to apologetics315.com, find that link on our weekly apologetics bonus links, and uh, hope that this website can be a great resource uh, to you, your friends, and your family members. All right, so uh, back to today's program again, uh, episode 101. Joined uh, as guest today, Dr. Craig Keener. Craig, thank you. Uh, now, before we get into uh, back talking about um, verses out of context, and specifically I want to ask you about prosperity verses, um, we do a segment on the show called Rapid Questions, and I didn't tell you about this, um, <laughs> and that's intentional, and I've got to find my questions now here. They're lying around here somewhere. Um, all right, here we are. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a 60-second segment of the program uh, where I ask all sorts of kind of fun, goofy questions uh, so we can really get to know you a little bit more and things about your life. So if you are ready, uh, I'll start the game clock and, um, and we'll, I'll get rolling. So the idea is to answer as many questions as fast as you can. So are you ready? Uh, you know, I write a four... Four volume comments are next. I'm going to have to be concise here, right? Okay. <laughs> Does Craig Keener know how to be concise? That's the question. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll start the game clock. That's hilarious, by the way. <laughs> All right. We'll start the game clock here and I'll ask the first question. What is your clothing store of choice? Uh, my wife shops for me. <laughs> Taco Bell or KFC? Uh. Uh, actually, I don't eat either one. They're too greasy for me. Oh. Uh, <laughs> what's your favorite sport? Um, I jog. Okay. What's Maydeen's uh, favorite holiday? Uh, maybe her birthday. <laughs> what's your What's your favorite movie? Oh, there's, uh, probably AD. Not not the more recent one, but the the one that came out in the seventies. Uh, who's one person you'd like to have dinner with to discuss a topic you disagree on? Oh, if it wasn't disagree, I would say Jesus from Revelation 3.20, but uh, disagree with, well, maybe some of my recent critics, but yeah. Do you drink Dr. Pepper? No, no nor Dr. Salt. <laughs> Last question. If you were a baseball pitch, which one would you be? I have no idea. This is how I get my writing done. I just control <laughs> So if you want to be like Craig Keener, stop watching sports. <laughs> well, don't watch TV in general. Just do your work. Yeah, just do your work. That's right. Do, read. Read lots of books and write. Yeah, that's great. Um, I do do Facebook, but anyway. I would like to learn. Um, so your your wife, Maydeen, um, uh, uh, you consider her birthday a holiday. <laughs> Well, well, actually, we do have to work on it. But it's also, she was born on November 11th. Okay. Uh, so, and Martin Luther was born on November 10th. So, I like to remind her that she's born on the 400, just after the 480th birthday of Martin Luther. Yeah, yeah. How about that? Very nice. So, so tell me, uh, you and your wife have um, really been seeking to um, uh, bring about racial reconciliation. Uh, for, for those that may not know, your wife uh, is African, um, yes. and uh, 
please tell me about sort of the history about how you guys met and, and her history and the work that you guys are doing uh, for toward racial reconciliation. Okay. Well, the, the short version, it's, it's all in a book called Impossible Love. Okay. Uh, but uh, the lo- long version would take a book. But, uh, <laughs> but we, we, we met at Duke University. I was doing my PhD in New Testament. She was an exchange student doing her PhD in Paris. Uh, at uh, on, on, she was studying African American history, and so she was in the U.S. and she was studying us, and she got one. But she went she went back to the um, to Congo where she's from. She was caught up in a civil war. We were separated, no contact for eighteen months. I didn't know if she was alive or dead. Uh. And you know I, I'm not real quick at making decisions, but that sped things up a bit afterwards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Happily married, and, and then and then there, of course there were other complications. Just when we were getting ready to uh, file the uh, the papers for the fiance visa, nine uh, eleven happened, and that kind of <sighs> changed immigration system, and <laughs> it was a mess. Yeah, right? what a headache! Oh, oh my. Okay, well, uh, for those that are interested to learn more about your story, uh, you can check out the book Impossible Love. Uh, and learn more about that and the work you guys are doing as well. Yeah. If you don't like uh, heavy academic works, that's my least academic work. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Um, I, I do want to ask you about prosperity verses, but uh, John uh, Leonetti here has brought up a, a great one that we should cover here. Matthew 18, where two or more are gathered. Um, mm-hmm. th- so this is, um, God's only going to be uh, there if two people are there. Is that right? <laughs> No, the the two or three in the context, it's referring back to the two or three witnesses. Mm. Uh, 18 verses 15 through 17, it's talking about church discipline. Mm. Uh, that's where the binding and loosing comes in, which background will be helpful for. But just to say, two or three witnesses in church discipline. So this is talking about where two or three are gathered. Uh, these are the, the the witnesses should be the first to to pray. Um, now, the, the principle is not that uh, you need two or three, and the principle is not that you can't have more than two or three. The principle is just, you know, he's he's dealing with the two or three who are in the context. Mm. And then he's on to say, uh, where two or three are gathered, you might name uh, there am I among them, uh, which fits a theme that runs through Matthew's gospel. Matthew one twenty three, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew twenty eight twenty, I'll be with you until the end of the age, and so in eighteen twenty, uh, also it's interesting. There was a, a Jewish saying that was circulating probably this early, and the saying goes like this: Where two or three are gathered uh, for the study of the Torah, there is my Shekinah, my presence among them, and so Jesus is claiming to be the very presence of the living God. Mm. Wow. It's fascinating when some people do use that phrase or two or more are gathered. Um, I, I mean, it's really important to point. No, if you're alone, God is still with you. Yes. Uh, and so don't be disheartened. Uh, so that, that verse sort of has these uh, unforeseen or unintended consequences when misinterpreted. Oh, what, one person was using it from the King James, at least one person, and saying... Uh, and, and they're agreeing as touching anything. So they said, okay, touch your TV set and <laughs> and pray with me. Uh, well, that was a translation issue. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's, let, um, let's take that and move along to a number of verses um, which can be misinterpreted to um, mean that if you, if you pray for God to give you a Corvette, God's going to give you a Corvette. If you if you name it and claim it in Jesus' name, you'll have it. Um, this is a uh, it, that in a nut in a nutshell is what's called the prosperity gospel. That God is out to make you richer and wealthier uh, as part of being His disciple. Uh, but you know, Jesus kind of also teaches that the world's going to hate His you know His disciples and that there will be persecution. Um, yes. So, how do we fit those verses 
uh, about the, pros- the supposed prosperity gospel or that are misinterpreted as supporting that. Um, how should we understand those verses? Well, they're all out of context. I mean, I, there w- I went through a phase as a young Christian where I accepted a lot of the ideas of that. I didn't really accept the prosperity part so much because I didn't see it in Scripture. Um, but some of the things about confessing and so on, um, with the prosperity part, it's always good to keep in mind the psalm that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. In other words, your desires need to be in the right direction. But also, um, people were using verses like Romans 10, 9 and 10, talk about confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And they were using that for confessing other things. Mm. You know, in the New Testament, when it talks about confessing, it talks about confessing sin, it talks about confessing Christ is Lord. And the one other place I found where it talks about confessing something um, is, is Hebrews chapter 11, where they confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth as an act of faith that God had this promise in the future for them. And they were therefore willing to suffer uh, in the in the present as they were awaiting that. You don't have them confessing anything like, you know, I'm going to get this or that. Uh, it's usually about confessing Christ, sometimes in the face of persecution. Hmm. What are some other verses uh, that people use to justify their idea that God's here to make me wealthier? Well, one of them was Psalm 50 we mentioned earlier. Um Third John, people often will, will quote the thing, uh, I want you to be, uh, to prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. Mm. And that was a standard greeting <laughs> in the ancient world. I mean, it was, there, there were a couple kinds of greetings. One was, um, one was uh, uh, um, Kyrene, which is a greeting that you have in Acts 15, you have it in James chapter 1. Uh, Kyrene just means greetings, but then um, it's usually adapted in the New Testament to charis, grace, uh, and then the added Jewish greeting, peace, and so it could sound like a good Jewish uh, greeting in a Greek letter. Um, I think you have something like that in Second Maccabees, uh, you know, grace and peace to you. It's a blessing from God. It's it's a prayer. May mm-hmm. God bless you. Yeah. And, and, and uh, the difference in the New Testament is it's not just may God the Father bless you, but, but grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus, implying his deity mm. right up front in all these letters. Um, well, this, this other thing is also like that. So it's legitimate to pray for somebody, to, to bless them, like in the sense, may God bless you with this. It, it was a prayer. It's mm. legitimate to pray like that. But it's not a guarantee that we're always going to have, um, you know, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. You know, the context of that is they've, they've, been, um, they've been taking care of Paul and his need, uh, and be, even beyond his need. And so Paul is trusting God to, to bless them. Um, but you've got all these texts about sacrificing financially. Um, the, the idea that we can trust God to supply our needs for what he's called us to do and, and for our basic living. And so we can bless others. Ephesians 4, um, about not stealing, but rather uh, working with your hands to, to give to others. Yeah. Matthew 6, oh, that one often gets quoted out of context about, uh, you know, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Yeah. And the context is don't seek the things that the pagans seek. And he's talking about food and clothing, I mean, basics. He says, rather, seek first God's kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. Well, the things he's talking about are, are basics. It's not like, you know, anyway. Yeah, it's, it's not all these, uh, you know, high-end cars or big mansions or anything like that. For Hebrews 11.1, 1, uh, some people, I think, still use this, but people used to use it a lot. Uh, now faith is the substance things hope for, and they'd say it's now faith. They'd make it an adjective describing faith, even though in English now is an adverb. Mm. Uh, but that's not the worst part of it. In Greek there, the word is not nun, now, it's de, which means but or and. And even if they didn't bother to look it up in Greek, if they'd read it in context, the context of it is 
persevering faith. Yeah. I mean, there is the kind of faith where you're you're believing God right now in the present. So, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to reduce the the importance of faith by any means, but to say we the importance of faith. Faith is only as good as, as its object. So, if you're believing God based on what God has actually said, that's great. If you're believing God based on verses out of context, not so great. <laughs> All right, um, I want to move us um, since we're here at the back end of the program uh, to uh, some of the more recent issues um, in the blogosphere and in some published works as well. Um, you uh, wrote the foreword to uh, Lydia McGrew's book, uh, Hidden in Plain View. And so that book is about undesigned coincidences where these, uh, at least what, what might appear to be uh, unplanned, you know, um, confirmations of events or instances or things a person said or where they were from can help to uh, really enhance the reliability of the Gospels. Um, so... I was curious to ask you, you know, what your thoughts were uh, on undesigned coincidences, and um, I had a specific question uh, as well. But but first, uh, let's see, you know, what do you think uh, is one one of the beneficial things, one of the most beneficial things to these undesigned coincidences in the scriptures? Well, I think I think it is helpful. It lets us know that the uh, the authors had additional information, and there were things that they were taking for granted, and they're other places where we can see that. I mean, even sometimes where you don't have what's called an undesigned coincidence, but just where the writer speaks as if he expects his audience to know about the story as well. Uh, like, you know, when in John 12, uh, Jesus, or John, John 11 or 12, where Jesus says, uh, this is the Mary who washed Jesus' feet. Yeah, it's in 12 where she washes his feet, and 11 where he mentions it. So his audience already knows the story and already knows the name of the person who did it. They're, they're taking for granted a much wider uh, repertoire of information. Mm. And Luke actually tells us, you know, I'm confirming these things, Theophilus, that you already know. So uh, I think that it's helpful in, in those ways. Yeah. So one of the questions I had, and as I've been thinking about this, um, I know that it's debated whether, say, uh, John had uh, the source material in front of him, that is, um, of, of the written works. So, you know, did John, say, have the Gospel of Mark in front of him, or Matthew or Luke, and he was, you know, writing based off of that? Um, I'm curious to know, if he had the material, would that make it an undesigned coincidence? I I don't think John had that material in front of him. Okay. I mean, I, I don't see how he could not have known that Mark was in circulation, for example. But, I mean, if John is an eyewitness, why would he need to depend on, on something else? True. So where he overlaps with them, it's not because, you know, because he's dependent on them. Yeah. I guess I could see, and this is very, again, contingent upon whether he did have the material in front of him, but say if he's looking at a, a you know, a, a, a passage um, he might add a detail that helps to corroborate the story, um, but I guess it wouldn't be like an unplanned or undesigned coincidence. It would just be a designed corroboration. Um, nevertheless, I, yeah. I, I think there are still other good examples of undesigned coincidences uh, in the scriptures. Um, so, um, okay, so now let me ask you this, and this has been a perhaps more controversial topic um, regarding the, the work of... I think what I said about John being a witness, uh, sometimes people think if you, if you don't say that there are other views, you don't know that there are other views. Obviously, I know I'm in the minority among biblical scholars, but I do think that John was a witness. So, just so you know that I, I was speaking for myself. Sure, sure. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, moving to the work of Mike Lacona. Um, he has uh, recently... Uh, you know, uh, was it last year he put out a book, Why Are the Differences in the Gospels? And um, therein he tries to draw from uh, the works of Plutarch. I don't know if you've had a chance to read his book. Yeah, I have. <clears throat> um, so, so Mike argues that there are these sort of literary devices uh, that the gospel authors used in their biographical work. 
Um, but this has led to the concern by some that if the authors had such liberties, that the Gospels become, in the eyes of these critics, the Gospels become less reliable because we don't really know what was happening. What's your take on those literary devices? Anybody who's worked their way through a synopsis of the Gospels knows very well that you have certain kinds of issues, certain kinds of differences there. Mm. What Mike has done is just shown that nobody nobody would, would worry about that because you've got these kinds of differences elsewhere in ancient literature. People just took for granted mm. that you could write that way. It's part of the genre. Now, uh, you know, in terms of the synopsis of the Gospels, I think what it also shows is you know, depending on which configuration of gospel sources you use, but I, I yeah, it, well, take the standard one, which is also pretty much my default one. Matthew and Luke are using Mark. If they make these changes, obviously they don't see a problem with it. So if they don't see a problem with it, why should we see a problem with it? When I'm saying changes like in, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus cleanses the temple. A little while later, he curses a fig tree. It withers at once. Jesus gives a lesson on faith. Mark chapter 11, Jesus curses a fig tree, goes in and cleanses the temple. They come back. They find the fig tree withered. And the disciples say, whoa, look at that. And Jesus says, you know, he gives the same lesson on faith. Hmm. Now, are you going to say he cursed two fig trees, uh, one before the before he cleansed the temple and one afterwards, when each gospel only mentions one fig tree, I think that we can show more respect to the biblical text, not by imposing our a prioris on it about how it should have been written based on how we expect people in our culture to write. That's, that's imposing an a priori on scripture. That's not approaching scripture as authoritative enough that we're willing to learn inductively from it how the authors felt they were being inspired to write. Mm. And so I think it's more respectful to to allow for those things. Now, I don't see undesigned coincidences and um, and literary devices as incompatible. Sure. I, I don't see why they have to be incompatible. Yeah, yeah. There could be instances where there's some overlap, uh, and there, there might be you know alternative ways, but they certainly don't strike me as mutually exclusive. Right. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I'll have to think more about that and, and all those issues. Um, it seems there's a lot going on in the blogosphere. Um, and yeah, I, that's how I get my writing yeah. done. <laughs> I don't keep up with the blogs either. I'm, I just, I write some Bible studies and put them on my blog, but yeah, it's you're, and, you're, and comics, but... <laughs> You're, uh, you're, you're all the better for probably just ignoring it and pressing on with your work. I try, but, but, but I, yeah, I'm not trying to, how do I put this? I, I think we can learn from both approaches. Mm. Yeah, nice. Um, and so one, th- one of the issues that I had been um, writing about, I was actually blogging a few weeks ago, <laughs> on, was the, the, the temple cleansings. Uh, so there's there are debates even amongst evangelicals about whether there's one temple cleansing or two, and uh, you know because in um, the synoptics the cleansing of the temple occurs later in Jesus's ministry, but in the John's gospel it uh, appears very early on, and mm-hmm. so this has led some to think oh well Jesus cleansed the temple twice. There are others that think perhaps John has moved the event. For different reasons, as you mentioned, the genre, there, there weren't necessarily hard and fast rules about how to write a biography. And so perhaps John moved the event uh, to convey some sense of Jesus, uh, make, you know, a theological message. Uh, so what's your, what's your take on the, the temple cleansing uh, example? Yeah, I mean, people can hold different views on whether it was at the beginning or the end or both. But... It isn't legitimate to say that it has to be in chronological order because, again, you know, it was about seven years after my conversion. I took a synopsis of the Gospels and spent, I don't know, a few weeks, whatever, working my way through it, passage by passage, figuring out 
how these passages relate to one another. Yeah. And it is simply not possible to, I mean, you can't force the Gospels into this of, of saying that they have to be in chronological order. And and if you if you do that, really, I think you're not really respecting the text. I, I think most people who do that, it's not that they are not intending to respect the text. I think they've simply never worked their way through a synopsis of the Gospels. Mm. If they haven't, then... You know, before we can really talk about it, they need to go back and do that mm. and see if they can still maintain their position. So, um, I know towards the beginning of the program, we talked about the importance of, of these assumptions and how the debate can often be had at these assumptions about the text or even the assumptions about a genre and uh, how this can even apply in these contemporary debates that are being had over issues of the Bible. And uh, yeah, so it seems like you mentioned um, the the genres here, that there were just different conventions of that day, and we need to understand those conventions. And if we just reject those conventions, it's going to lead us to some stretched interpretations of passages yeah. and difficulties we'd we, have to we, embrace. Um, we impose on the Gospels our own a prioris that are based on our own cultural assumptions, we're imposing on them rules of genres that did not yet exist in their current form, mm. rather than understanding them the way that they present themselves to be understood. And then if you go back and you study ancient literature, hey, you know, the Gospels are among the most reliable. I mean, they're, they're, it's very few cases where we have an ancient figure where you have biographies of the figure written within living memory of that figure, multiple biographies with multiple eyewitness sources. I mean, you've got Socrates, you've got Jesus, you know, you've got a couple Roman emperors, but you really don't have very much like that. I mean, it's one of our best sources, but you go imposing these modern grids on it, then somebody like Bart Ehrman comes along. Mm. <laughs> points to all the holes in your argument, and you say, oh, no, maybe the Gospels aren't reliable. Well, they're not reliable only according to an a priori standard by which they were not meant to be judged. It's mm. a really unfair standard. Mm. Yeah, it's it, anachronistic, and it's culturally imperialistic. Uh, yeah. I, I've often uh, told people that Bart Ehrman is still a fundamentalist. <laughs> Right? He, he, he argues that way in popular debate. That's right. That's the way he argues, even though he doesn't actually himself believe that. Yeah. But, but, he, but he used to, right? He used to think that of the text. He held, he, he held it to such a wooden standard. And when these issues of difficulties arose in his study, he, faith went out the window. Um, for him, it wasn't even reevaluating the way he viewed the Gospels. He just... You know, I think th that in conjunction with, you know, he said the problem of evil, I think yeah, led him away from the faith. Part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, you philosophers and theologians take care of that one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Well, we've, we've taken up your time here, Craig. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. We'll have to bring you on the program again. You let me know whatever you want to cover and we'll, we'll, we'll have a fun time again. Thank, thank, thanks so much, Kurt. Great. God bless you and all the work that you're doing. God bless you and your work, too. Brother. Thank you. All right. Well, that does it for today's program. I am grateful for the continued support of our uh, patrons and the partnerships with our sponsors, Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, the Illinois Family Institute, Fox Restoration, and Nonprofit Megaphone. I want to thank our technical producer today, Rob. That's uh, Rob Emmett, 1R10, two of everything else. And thank you for coming in. And uh, to our guest today, uh, Craig Keener. What If you are unfamiliar with his work, please do a Google search. Check out all that's there. Watch some of his videos. You know, he, he does these vlogs on his own YouTube page. Uh, you can check those out. Um, and last but not least, and certainly not least, I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.